Alexander. Good afternoon and welcome to our... Actually, we didn't reveal the secret to anyone because we are actually here in a time machine <laughs> which will uh, bring us a little bit to the past uh, with the help of CEDEFOP, uh, the fantastic agency on vocational education uh, and training. I and uh, I, I will give, Ilya, Please, for you the hear me. We can see you and we can wait a little because I have to explain, uh, explain to the uh, fantastic young people around. Uh, I can see in front of me. And for, probably you don't see. Do you hear me, Ilya? No? Oh. Can you, do we have technicians to help? I can hear you now. You can hear me? <laughs> okay. Okay. It's perfect. So, uh, just I was welcoming everyone to the workshop on green and digital transition. And uh, although maybe you can see that, that uh, green is green and digital is digital, uh, these two transitions, or mega trends as they call, they go together. Yeah, who is switching me off? Who is hooliganing? <laughs> and as I said, that would be an interesting trip. We will have uh, around one hour. And uh, we will have a very good speakers and uh, interesting interventions, uh, speaking both about uh, green and, uh, and digital, giving uh, country examples, giving uh, personal uh, uh, examples. And also, as I said, this is like a time machine. Let's see uh, what skills, what is the, the skills demand uh, at the moment uh, in terms of green and digital. What is the forecast for the future? Or whether CEDEFOP can predict that and how they are doing that and how you can uh, learn more uh, because you are still uh, uh, in the way when you are choosing your career, when you are trying to uh, also shape your own future. So you can uh, get a lot of, 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 of the insight from uh, the work CEDEFOP is doing in this domain. So uh, then... Um, of course, as I, as I have mentioned, you cannot separate uh, uh, these two trends. Uh, they go together. But nevertheless, when it comes to uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, deeper uh, knowledge on, uh, on the topic, of course, you have to look what is the technological changes, what is the are happening in terms of development of artificial intelligence, of, or of digitalization of their workplaces, of uh, also how digital uh, things are impacting not only work and jobs we have, but also uh, shaping our uh, life. And, uh, and this, is, this is also important to see. So we know uh, now in front, uh, the first speaker you can see on your screens, it's uh, Elias Livanos, and uh, he is uh, remotely from Greece. Uh, this is uh, where the European Commission's Agency on Vocational Education and Training is uh, uh, situated. So he couldn't come to be with us, but uh, I'm sure that he will give a very interesting insight. And maybe you also uh, can give us kind of a little bit of, of the trends, as I said, I promise there will be time machine. <laughs> so uh, what was, I know that CDFOP started to speak about, about these topics uh, already decades ago and predicting things, whether these predictions were uh, uh, as you were, uh, envisaged them, were envisaging them. Uh, what do you think about how uh, reliable the, the information, the data you are collecting, and how much uh, uh, it, is, uh, it can predict the future development? So, and by this, I give you the floor, and I hope that you are connected and we can hear you. I am connected. Good afternoon to everybody, and thank you so much for the invitation. I hope you can hear me fine. Uh, so, you said about the twin transitions, and this is the uh, green and digital 
of course. And we need to think that this, they do have an impact on skills needed as the transitions influence the economy. And of course, it is the economy that dictates which skills are needed. And as you say, they have uh, gained a lot of importance, but for different reasons. So starting with the green transition, I would say that it is a necessity and it is not optional anymore. And this is because most human economic activities have a negative impact on the environment. And this impact fires back with a series of negative outcomes, such as droughts, famine, floods, ending up to very negative ones like diseases and wars. So to avoid all this, we need to become more efficient and adopt a series of green practices, which in the end of the day, influence employment and the skills needed. So for the green transition, employment will move away from traditional brown sectors, such as mining, towards more renewable ones, such as water and electricity. Consequently, we would need less people in mining and more in electricity and water. At the same time, we would need people with the technical skills to implement the Green Deal, for example, installers of green technologies, but also people, all people will need to develop their non-cognitive skills and be more friendly to the environment whatever they do, uh, either this being in employment or other personal lives. Now, artificial intelligence, it is more of an evolution trend. As technology advances, we make operations simpler for us with the aim to free up time that can be devoted to more complex activities that they are difficult to automate. So if you like the impact of AI, I will be increased productivity, which is a good thing, of course, but this could mean that we would need less people as we become more efficient. So again, there will be sectors benefiting, such as computing or programming, while employment will be withheld for most other sectors. In terms of skills, I think it is made uh, clear that AI and automation will favor high skills at the expense of low and medium skills. But I think now what is important to note is that these trends, AI and greening or automation, do not happen in isolation. In between, we have other impacts such as the pandemic, the geopolitical tensions and the energy crisis that they all influence the skills and jobs we need. So we really need to be careful before we jump uh, quickly into any uh, conclusions. Yes, but uh, Elias, we know both uh, of you because I'm also uh, a member of the European Economic and Social Committee. I didn't introduce myself. <laughs> and uh, I'm coming from Lithuania, uh, and uh, I'm trade unionist, uh, coming from Education and Science Trade Unions uh, a Union. And I know that uh, uh, there is a, a, a constant, constant kind of, uh, uh, most, I would say, uh, how to so blaming maybe from employers that education failed to prepare the right skills for employment. At the same time, uh, we see huge mismatches. Yeah, and we know that CDFOP is trying to predict. Uh, researchers do their best to uh, to see the that data to 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 translate that into uh, into the language which would be understandable for the practitioners. And nevertheless, we see these gaps. We constantly see that uh, we are failing failing to uh, uh, actually to prepare our workforce where do you think the biggest uh, responsibility lays on whom i mean on politicians or on, on the systems it's themselves because education systems are very conservative uh, researchers who are let's say like today i i looked in the morning on the forecast it says no rain in Brussels. I looked outside. This is rain. I say that that's maybe another Brussels. What uh, what 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 was predicted? But in this Brussels, it definitely was rain in the morning. So maybe maybe and you know yourself, yeah, you, 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 you many times uh, the the forecasting of of the word didn't work. The same maybe with the skills. What would you say? So this is a very good question, but unfortunately there is no clear-cut answer. But I think that the biggest challenge comes from the supply side and the fact that aging of population has not been dealt with effectively. And to make this more visual, we can think the uh, the workforce, the structure of the workforce, like a spinning top. So a good spinning top looks something like this. It is thick in the middle and it is thin on top and at the bottom. And we can think of the middle part being the core workforce. This is people aged 25 to 55, and the uh, bottom part being people 55 plus, and the top being the young people. And uh, the, the role of the bottom and the top is to, to support the middle. Now, think that 
time passes and the spinning top keeps spinning, but what's happening in the forecast, and uh, it has been happening for some decades now, is that the middle part has been thinning and all the policies are focusing how to make the bottom thicker. This is the uh, participation and extending the, the working life. So if you can, if you, if you, as you can imagine, thinning of the middle of the workforce or the spinning top, it is not good. It's not good for the spinning top, it will stop spinning and it is not good for the uh, the workforce. So the, the, the main challenge here is what can we do in order to reverse uh, this trend of thinning of the middle so the future workforce has the challenge, the numbers needed. Uh, but on the other hand, as you say, if we take these trends for uh, granted and there is nothing we can do, then we need to think how education and vet policies can be better prepared for continuous upskilling and reskilling of a workforce that is aging, which, as you can imagine, given all these trends that we talked about, can be quite challenging. I see, but also uh, actually using this opportunity that we in front uh, of me, I can see, I don't know if you can see also a lot of uh, young people who, as already uh, mentioned, still maybe in the way building their career. Which sectors uh, you see uh, uh, would have uh, biggest job opportunities, what let's say having perspective? To where uh, would I, if I were making my career, would I re-end now? Okay, so as I mentioned before, sectors related to the twin transitions like computing, water, electricity will benefit in terms of employment. Also sectors in the supply chain of the green and digital, such as in engineering, architecture, research and development will also benefit as they will need to facilitate the transitions. Health and care are another two sectors that will be creating many jobs in the future. But this is not just it. Job openings have two components. It is new jobs, meaning jobs not existing before, but also job openings for replacing workers retiring, changing jobs or moving out from the workforce. And in fact, we know that nine out of 10 job openings will be because of replacement, uh, replacement needs. And let me give you an example. If we look at manufacturing, which is a sector that has very heavy penetration of robots, and we look at the future, we see that employment will more or less remain stable. So we may say that there will be no job opportunities for this sector. But if we calculate the replacement needs, we see that manufacturing will actually be one of the major employments to 2035. So again, we need to be careful and not to be carried away just by looking at, it, at the trends as there will be plenty of job openings for uh, sectors that are even uh, declining. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I don't know if you could stay with us because we will have also other panelists and maybe at the end we will have time and uh, then we will of course take questions from the, uh, uh, the, the, the those who are sitting in the, our workshop. So let's uh, let's then move let's let's move then to the youth representative. We have. Um, uh, in front of us, Maria Rodriguez Alcazar, and she's president of European Youth Forum. And Maria, I know that uh, uh, the, 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 the world of young people are even today, uh, the uh, commissioner mentioned that we have uh, a lot of uh, initiatives uh, which are uh, oriented to support the youth involvement, uh, like youth action plan, for instance, directly that uh, the, the, the young people are involved in decision making, young people are heard and, uh, uh, and consulted in the due time. We still uh, see the barrier. Of course, we remember the movement of Greta Thunberg and still people, young people who are going to the streets, but I know that you are the person who is going to the cabinets, the one who is speaking with politicians. So what, what you would uh, say in terms of your experience, do you feel that uh, a, a situation has improved because the, this political will to have youth on board is here, or is it just because maybe before the elections, <laughs> so elections is like young people are in demand because uh, uh, all the vo uh, voices count, and then politicians suddenly become very welcoming. So, what would what, what be your experience? Please share. Okay, sorry. 
Yeah, thank you so much, and thank you so much, Tatiana, for, for this question. Uh, I'm Maria Rodriguez, and I'm the president of the European Youth Forum, that is the platform for youth organizations in, in Europe. And actually, we, we very much see like how the interests of different commissioners or part of the Commission Parliament um, are in, in terms of youth engagement. And I must say that uh, 2022, that was the European Year of Youth, really sparked the interest of, of different parts of the Commission to engage with young people, with a young representation of, of young people. Uh, but I must say that that was uh, not universal in a way. So we could engage much more. So as European Youth Forum, as the organization representing young people at the European level, it's true that we had much more uh, engagement. But then at the national level, we still see that that's not that common. Uh, for many national youth councils that are actually the structures representing young people at the national level, so the platforms for youth organizations that are democrat democratically elected and, and led by young people, it happens very often the case that uh, those national institutions are actually not engaging with them, not giving them any space on the table to discuss or to even, you know, propose the topics that are interesting or, or a challenge for young people. So I think uh, we also should keep that in mind that actually this effort of engaging with young people shouldn't only be at the European institutions that I can say that it improved, but also it should translate in, in different levels. So for example, at the committee of the regions, they also supported these efforts with a, a charter on youth and democracy and also this, uh, this institution, the, the European Economic and Social Committee, supported the, the efforts having a youth test that is basically a tool for all the different initiatives, all, all the opinions of the EESC to have a youth check. So meaning that all the initiatives, uh, young people, so they have participation of young people, the assessment of the different impacts that it can have on, on young people and whether it will be positive or negative are checked before it's issued. And then if, if there are negative consequences, there is also a mitigation, uh, mitigation measures that are developed. So for us, that's very important. And also the commission after the European Year of Youth uh, they have committed to develop this youth check as well. So we are very uh, grateful now that there will be this inspiration coming from the ESC as one of the first institutions actually implementing this. So I must say that there are very positive trends also at the national level. So for example, now for the European elections, we will see that 16 and 17 years old in Germany and in Belgium, they will be able to vote, as well as in Malta and, and Austria, that, uh, that was already a policy, and we hope that this will inspire other member states. So I see very positive steps in terms of youth engagement, uh, and I think we can be happy about it. Also, there are many initiatives uh, happening at the European Commission level, but there is a still long way to go, especially when we look at the different levels of engagement. Yes, thank, thank you very much. In, indeed, I, uh, I think that it helps us a lot that we have uh, used also uh, our voice when uh, we are drafting our opinions. However, it also uh, the huge responsibility and uh, also the, in terms of skills. What do you think that skills young people should possess that they can be active not only, uh, I mean, be, being, uh, uh, I mean, uh, workers or students, etc., but also to impact the, the, the political level? So, from your perspective, what would be that skills? Do. Well, I think uh, you learn really a lot when you engage in youth organizations, uh, I must say. So in my case, for example, I started when I was 14 years old and already uh, influencing education laws, for example. And I think it's, it's crucial to know how institutions work. So I don't know if that's really a skill, but I mean, it's... Uh, kind of the eagerness of knowing how, how the democratic system works. But I think it's crucial um, learning like how to work in, in teams with different people, because at the end of the day, when you are trying to influence uh, policies, you are not just bringing your own opinion, not just your opinion, but you are building with others, like understanding that there are common issues that you are facing and also kind of coming up with the best solution that, that can be proposed to the institutions. Of course, something that I've also learned in, in youth organizations, in, in my case, it was uh, leadership skills. No, this, 
this drive that maybe most of us, we have to, to do things, to actually put it together and organize people around that. But I would say also it's very important, um, more the emotional skills, uh, that we don't talk about them that often, but more in terms of empathy, being able to understand other people, to put ourselves in their positions, also to understand why other people are not participating and how we can make also other people participate, like making an enabling environment for other people to, to get engaged. So I think those are kind of the skills that I gain. Of course, uh, after some years, you, you also understand how you can better do your advocacy, how you should approach policymakers, what's the right tone that you may use with some people in some places. Also, how to use the different mechanisms that we have at our disposal. So that means, for example, going to a meeting, but also, if needed, going to the streets. So it's like uh, understanding what are the different tools that we have, uh, again, at our disposal and being able to understand when to use uh, all of them. And of course, one thing that I discover in youth organizations, and I honestly encourage all of you to engage in youth organizations or any kind of projects, is more on discovering yourself, discovering your, the skills that you have and also the talents that you have and building together with others and supporting others and, and getting support from others to actually develop those skills or those things that you want to do in life. So yeah, that's my take on, on the skills question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in other words, as you said, from the cabinet of, of the commission now to go to the street, you have to be very adaptive immediately. Yeah? You have to, to, to have right, uh, right words when you think with, you speak with politicians and when you speak with the, 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 your colleagues to convince them and when you b build the team and etc. So great. So everyone follows the, uh, the uh, I hope that youth organizations and, and uh, I just, if you are not uh, united at national level please do this because it's very important and as we have already mentioned national level is still uh, not in all countries young people are involved at national level to policy uh, making process so it's still a huge opportunity by this we go to Sweden and uh, we have also my colleague member of the European Economic uh, and Social Committee Christian Arder and um, we know that uh, Sweden uh, is not only example for maybe democratic developments and, and involvement of youth, <laughs> which I am not supposed you to talk about, but I want you also to give Sweden as an example of uh, uh, a kind of being pioneer and also progressing in terms of sustainable uh, uh, development and how you uh, as employer perceive the development of industry in, in Sweden. Thank you for that question, Tatiana. Uh, as I'm completely unprepared for this. <laughs> no, uh, I would say that uh, north of Sweden is actually uh, the cradle for the green transition. Uh, there are a, a huge amount of, of natural resources, uh, rivers uh, for uh, electrical power, hydropower, uh, the land, uh, you know, in Sweden, 90% of the land is, is not built on or used for agriculture. So uh, uh, almost 70% is covered with, with forest. There are uh, rare mineral uh, uh, deposits that have recently been found. Uh, iron ore, uh, the biggest mine in Europe, underground mine in Europe, is in uh, Kiruna. Um, and I also learned uh, just today uh, that... Uh, 25% of the resources of uranium in Europe uh, uh, lies in uh, underground in Sweden. So I would like first maybe to uh, show a, a short, very short video a clip here that, that uh, gives you an impression of what is going on and then we can continue with the, some, some other remarks from my side. Thank you so long.
As I promised, time machine. <laughs> I, I, I really like that. Uh, I think it's very nice and shows, shows the potential uh, from this region. I mean, you saw uh, uh, examples of uh, industrial projects up there with a battery factory in Northvolt, um, green steel production, um, uh, steel uh, and uh, iron ore, for, um, how do you say, um, processing of uh, iron ore to, to be used for steel production and so on. And actually the whole uh, city of uh, Kiruna is being moved in order to uh, uh, use the latest deposit that they have found. Um, another example of what they have done is um, uh, you know, a dumper. Uh, a dumper is a big truck that you use for mining. And they have made the first uh, completely fossil-free uh, dumper by steel from uh, from this one of these companies uh, up in, in in the north, uh, CO2 neutral uh, steel uh, manufacturing, and it goes on uh, electrical power. So just just to, just to show you that these examples uh, are real and exist, and um, we have. Uh, mainly two problems up here, two problems in order for this to happen fully. Uh, and the, the, ma the major problem, the main problem is the labor shortages. Uh, so here in this region, um, people have been used to move out. They have been used to move to places like Stockholm and the south of Sweden where the jobs exist. Now it's on the contrary. Now there is a need for people to move up here. Um, and they predict that there's about uh, 25,000 uh, employees that are needed within uh, five to 10 years. Where do we find these people? Where do they come from? What skills do they have? What exp uh, more specifically, what kind of skills uh, and jobs uh, are needed? I think uh, if we look at, at in the industrial sector here, it's uh, engineers, um, electricians, uh, machine operators, uh, and they have all, all to be used to work with automation because the workplaces here are really uh, nice, so to say. Uh, it's, not, it's not dirty work, it's, it's highly automated uh, workplaces. Um, but we have, um, as uh, Tatiana mentioned, uh, not to blame anyone for not uh, giving the right conditions. It is, uh, as you see from this video, about also to make the jobs attractive, to tell about uh, the jobs that exist here, the potential, but also to make the uh, whole area, the whole uh, region more attractive. Uh, and from, from my perspective, um, and I, if I'm talking to young people like yourselves, uh, why not uh, look uh, a little bit further into this, uh, see what is there for me, uh, is it interesting to go to uh, uh, Arctic uh, Sweden? Uh, is it only night the whole winter? Yes, probably yes. <laughs> but there are other things, and I, I mean, it could be a kind of an ad adventure to also look into to the positive uh, sides of it. It's not, uh, of course, it's not Italy or Murcia or uh, or so uh, when it comes to the climate. But you will for sure have uh, snow to ski on. Uh, the whole winter and and so on. So I think that that is that is to say uh, that we have we have this uh, one problem. The second problem, if I may, is uh, is actually about uh, land use. We are not talking about competences, and skills, and so on. But uh, we 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 actually need to use the land for the purposes of mining, of industrial projects, and of construction, because there is a need to build houses for people who move out, move up. We don't want people to just move in and then go, go home uh, and live in barracks. They have to live in houses, so there needs to be built houses, and that has to be built on, on the ground. And it's, uh, in, in, as I said, in Sweden we have 90%, which is virgin land, so we can build on virgin land. It's not a big problem. Uh, maybe in Malta, I don't know, uh, Flanders, where you don't have so much land. But this is also a, a little bit of a bottleneck that we'll have to look into to make it more uh, easy to use the land for, for these kind of purposes. So I, st I stop there. Thank you. That, that's, that's perfect for me. Actually, I want to ask you a question. You are completely unprepared for that because this was not foreseen, but it comes from the discussion we had uh, with the commissioner when young people were asking 
how to make, uh, let's say, this is a bad image, I wouldn't want to say that, but how to make vocation education and training attractive and what do you think those needs, skills needs, or, 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 or you mentioned the labor shortages, do they require you need uh, uh, university degrees or is it vocational education and training mainly? Yeah, I think uh, if, if you're talking about this particular region, um, it would probably be all kinds of uh, levels of education, uh, from engineers to, uh, to manual work. But uh, if, you, if, if I may, um, there is uh, a new uh, kind, uh, rather new, two years old, uh, an agreement between the Swedish social partners that uh, facilitates the possibility for people to take leave from uh, their jobs in order to reskill, upskill uh, according to their own uh, wishes or what purposes they can see for themselves. So it has not to be related to the, uh, the kind of employment they have already, but it could be um, uh, new employment uh, for, for the entire labor market. That was an agreement which was made between the major social partners in Sweden. Uh, so that, that was something that was, let's say, uh, given to the, to, to the trade union side, whereas the employer side got uh, in their bargain uh, more flexibility in, uh, in the uh, contractual law for employment. Uh, I think it's a very good example of what can happen if you agree about uh, things without interference from outside. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I think we will have uh, then questions later on uh, from our audience, but I want to move to Neja, uh, who is also my colleague uh, in the European Economic and Social Committee, and she is uh, Slovenian. She is uh, uh, the, from the Youth Council in Slovenia. So, Neja, I would like you to a little bit refocus the discussion because we, the participants will say we came to here as you speak uh, green and digital, so maybe we need a little bit more. We just heard about sustainable development, green development, of course, which are, as we already said, and Elias at the beginning, go hand in hand, because this is about, uh, the, the, the video was demonstrating that. We have cataclysms, we have catastrophic uh, developments on the earth, and if we are not uh, uh, taking it seriously, we are not uh, uh, becoming uh, 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 kind of more looking how, how to use artificial intelligence, how to use digitalization, uh, and how to make it in a sustainable way, we uh, may lose this battle for our planet. So, Neja, what is your experience, your personal experience? Yeah, thank you for the word. Uh, one of the things for me that is really interesting is that uh, in any case, when we talk about skills, we have to adopt the transformation mindset, for sure. So for me, what that means is, for example, if we take it from nature, huh? now it's, uh, the spring is coming, if you take a caterpillar, it has to know that it, at some point it will have to develop to become a butterfly. And it has to own a proper skill to do that. For them, it's natural. But maybe, you know, if you would um, train too much, you could have, instead of a butterfly, just a really fast caterpillar. So turbo caterpillar, but it would not be achieving its full potential because it is developing the wrong skill. And this is a transformation asset or mindset that I'm thinking about. Um, if, you, if, if I apply to the vocations, for example, we, uh, you mentioned before a time machine. Um, in the beginning of the 20th century, the, you still had a profession of a professional person who would be putting a candle into a light street light, light keeper. It was uh, one of the professions. You don't need that anymore now. You, in the, uh, let's say in the 90s or early 2000s, you can have an electrician who would be plugging in the electric lamp to electric system. But what happens now? Let's say in 2030, maybe all of the lamps are already remote-controlled solar panel lamps. So in only 100 years, the profession taking care of the same need, having light on the street, completely changed. So a grandfather who was a light keeper with a candle couldn't do this job anymore with solar panels. 
without transformation. And that's why this transformative moment is really interesting to observe and to see, you know, what can I do if I don't know what is coming? How can I really prepare myself? What kind of skill can I, can I achieve? And like, so what I've learned from my personal experience was just, okay, I try to pick a skill, I hold on to it, I try to get the best as I can in this, and then I hope I'm not the fast caterpillar, and, but I'm the, 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 the butterfly. Uh, of course, informing yourself helps a lot. Getting training, informal learning, non-formal education helps a lot. But it's a lot in this proactive, transformative attitude. If you don't want to develop, you're just going to stay where you are. And it doesn't matter how old you are. It's okay for young people. They always encourage um, us to, you know, you should have this, you know, open mindset and take on new skills and new stuff. Well, well maybe you don't need to take new ones, but you re have to, you know, follow the news, follow the, the things that are happening in the real world and, yeah, be becoming the best butterfly that you personally can. No? So that's for the start. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Neja. Yeah, that's uh, that's true. That's what uh, uh, what's happening happen, happening very rapidly. Yeah, and uh, uh, even when you start your education, that's why I'm I'm uh, worrying more about higher education because when you start, uh, I mean, as a doctor, yeah, just your studies is completely different when you finish because the medicine. Is, is, is developing so fast. So it might be completely not true when you are finishing your education because it takes, it takes uh, some nine years for, to become a doctor. So imagine how much it is, it is needed to, to, to learn. So for me, it's fast education or maybe pieces of education. I, I think that would be uh, in, the, in the future very popular. Of course, there will be classic professions that will require this and academic, deep academic knowledge and etc. And now, I uh, have good news for you. Uh, you probably, all of you have questions now, I'm sure. But the first who will give questions for, the, our, for our panel will get some small awards because we have awards uh, event today. So there are more awards uh, for the active participants. So just raise your hand, uh, introduce yourself, and uh, ask a question uh, uh, to panelists. Also, uh, Elias Sedefop, who is, who is waiting here, uh, also to have a question. So raise your hands. You will never regret that. <laughs> I see a lot of hands. Just have to choose. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Anything. Ah, you see, he knows something. He knows something. Okay. Uh, no, you don't have. Oh, okay, you lost the opportunity. Yes, where, 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 where? Ah, yes. Okay, then, then uh, option two. We will ask you questions. Yes, I know. I know. No, 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 no. She, she's our uh, supporter. You have a question? Yeah, she, she's with function. She supports us with the will. Unless someone wants to go to the will, because there are five questions which uh, need your answer. The one who will answer the question or we will be very close will be awarded. So, and also panelists can participate. So now it's open for everyone. Ilya, you can also answer the specific questions if you know the answer. <laughs> so please move that. Maybe I can also ask the question first. Yes, ask, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, because I'm also still young, I just graduated, so I'm also like uh, very interested in this panel. Um, because yeah, we're talking about upskilling um, the the population, but sometimes I struggle a bit with what this actually means in like concrete and practical terms. So for example, like I just finished my education, and maybe I do want to work in like uh, the renewable energy technology field. Um, but then I wonder like what kind of opportunities there are for me because now maybe I won't get hired for certain jobs because I don't have the right background. Um, but then what can I do? Like is it, is it courses, as you also said, like informal learning, formal learning. But what can I really like concretely think of that I can do to upskill myself? Thank you. Very, very good question. Uh, I think it goes for set up. <laughs> what is upskilling, Ilya? 
if you are with us, please uh, take the floor because uh, indeed we say reskilling, upskilling, and when reskilling, when um, some understand that this is you change completely the direction, you reskill yourself because there is no more this uh, job uh, in the market, uh, uh, vacancies, no more vacancies in the uh, job market. But yes, what is upskilling? Elia is with us? He's gone. He's gone. Nobody wants to answer the question, yeah? <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> he doesn't hear? We don't hear him. We don't see either. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. So. Okay. Some curious lady in the uh, I just asked about upskilling. I what is that? The question, yes. <laughs> I was able to hear. Should I answer? Yes. Fantastic. Okay, so it's a very good question indeed. Uh, I do believe upskilling and reskilling it's something that has a shared responsibility. So uh, the, the young lady said what most young people say that uh, when the transition from education to work comes, the first thing that the companies or the organization would ask for is working experience. So there is the institutional framework that should facilitate this transition. So they should be able to take care of that. But even so, when it comes to uh, upskilling further on, then the responsibility is shared between the uh, assuming that you have ac acquired and obtained the formal education you need to enter the, the job market, then uh, the workplace is responsible for keeping your skills up to date, but also yourself because we need to continuously look at what is available out there. Tatiana, you mentioned about uh, the medical doctor, but I can ensure you that there are other professions like IT professionals, for example, that their skills could be made obsolete at no time. I was uh, at an event uh, last week and there was a professor from the computing uh, department and he was saying that he, I put such a big effort to learn this new programming language called R and after one year we have Python and nobody uses R anymore. So imagine somebody being in his, you know, 55 that he's being challenged, but still he needs to take the extra step. So young people, indeed, they should have their eyes open. They should uh, make their technology their ally, not their enemy and uh, they should continue with this mindset until the very exit of the labor market. So that would be my answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's interesting because now we will compare the answer of the youth representatives, Maria. What is, from your perspective, upskilling? Yeah, thank you f so much for the question because I often see many young people that they say, okay, I, I didn't get that job yet, so then how I should re-skill, upskill, or do this thing. And I think it's uh, it's very important, something that uh, Nesha mentioned before, keeping up for the news, uh, for example. So, I mean, understanding that the world is evolving, even in our own fields. You were mentioning sustainability or energy, but I think that happens in all the fields. So I think it's very important that we have this mentality of wanting to become better at the things that we are doing. So then there are so many trainings that are offered by the employment services, for example, but also so many other trainings that we can find online. And many times it's not just about a training, a particular training, but it's about, you know, like just reading about how things are evolving, uh, how some technologies are emerging, for example. And one thing that for me is also key uh, and that can provide you extra skills, it's not only thinking about the hard skills for the job that you want to develop, but also to develop those soft skills. And for this, I think it adds a lot of value, like volunteering, for example. I was talking before about youth organizations, but this can be also involved in getting involved in any project. Also showing that you have, you know, interest in other things, that you, that you have added value that uh, that is to be offered in in those companies so and that's also a way of upskilling yourself 
because you are developing there, as I was mentioning before, teamwork abilities, uh, speaking in public, you are, don't know, being able to empathize with other people, you are able to organize events. So that's, that's kind of skills that usually you are not trained for that in VIT or like in, in, at university, but then you practically learn how to develop when you get engaged in some organizations or some projects. So I think that's really a very good way of also upskilling yourself to be uh, like more trained, let's say, for the labor market. Yes, now we have two answers, research uh, representative, youth representatives. What is employers' point of view on, on upskilling? Well, I, I would say that if you look at it from, from the employer's perspective, uh, it is about uh, how to make, I mean, if I now say, since I talked about the north of Sweden where there's a huge uh, lack of uh, labor, uh, to, make, to make themselves attractive as employers, because, I mean, we are talking uh, to a large extent about industry and maybe uh, many of you think that industry, that is dirty work and that is uh, bad working conditions and, and so on and so forth, which it is not. So there is something that uh, employers need to, I mean, we, we are talking about different uh, production resources, of course, I mean, capital, labor and land. And all of these three interact. In order to become innovative, you must use all of them. Um, and to have also innovative work methods uh, is important for, to show the attractiveness of, of the job. Uh, so the industry is becoming cleaner and cleaner. Uh, they are very much engaged in this um, green transition. Uh, I mean, you need to have... Uh, industry to produce the batteries for the electrical vehicles. You need to have industry to produce the steel for the, um, for the uh, electrical vehicles. Just to take one example, steel in the north of, of Sweden is, uh, I think, one, uh, one of the biggest polluters of CO2. Uh, it's about 10%, but they are working towards 30, 45, I think it is, to make completely CO2 neutral production of steel. So it is, it's on the right path, and I, I think that is something for, that young people are, are concerned with, that you are working in an environment which is going in the right direction towards climate neutrality. So that, that's, that's, that's good. That's also all kinds of jobs that are needed. I, I didn't mention all kinds of jobs, but there are, of course, nurses, teachers, and uh, librarians, and so on. Um, so that's, um, yeah, from, from, from my perspective, I think that, that concludes a little bit what, uh, what, what from, from businesses, what, what they need. Um, and it's difficult to say exactly what, what the uh, individuals, what they have to look at. But uh, take a look at the, the website that was on the first, where the, where the first video link was um, uh, published on, minddig.com. Uh, they have uh, the jobs that, that you can look for up there, and, uh, and they also have uh, interesting uh, news about what is going on and everything. So, Great. And as we don't have much time, unfortunately, to play and also to give uh, fantastic awards for all uh, who actively uh, would actively participate in that uh, answering, I will give you the answers which are very much connected of with what we have discussed. Uh, the green transition will create, according to uh, various estimations, because there are different estimations, but from one to 2.5 million new jobs till 2030. It's a huge potential. So what uh, Christian is saying, it's true. There are a lot of opportunities, and there will be even more opportunities, so use this. Then uh, there we have a target to have uh, by 2030, it's also in the Bill of Social Rights, it's uh, in the other uh, uh, documents, that we say that we should have uh, people to have digital, so ICT skills uh, uh, should be 20 million uh, figure as is foreseen. Unfortunately, we are still lacking approximately 11 million, so it's a lot. It's, I speak about the European Union. And uh, when I will speak about uh, the, uh, it's also that we said that we need upskilling and uh, 
uh, I mean, uh, reskilling, but there are also overqualified people who are coming to the job and they are overqualified. So there is uh, those who are underqualified and overqualified, and we call this a kind of mismatch of skills. This we speak about 80 million of workers in the European Union. So we, we have huge potential here, and also we see the, the dynamics of, of the old developments. So some, some, uh, uh, some of them are also victims of this huge, big and, uh, I mean, rapid transition, uh, green or digital transition. So there are plenty of opportunities at the same time. There is also a lot of, 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 of you to, uh, to see and, 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 and to try. Uh, in, 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 in front of you, you have a, a long life, and they will, you will see much more of these uh, challenges and developments. And uh, indeed, transversal skills like adapt uh, adaptability, critical thinking, they are very important. Also, uh, communication skills, uh, with, together with digital, uh, we shouldn't lose the communication skills. But what is really foring me, and you say that I answered four questions, but not the fifth question. And the fifth question is not about uh, uh, the uh, uh, green or digital skills. The fifth question is about uh, the number of young people who lack understanding of the European Union, living in the European Union, but they have no understanding of how European Union works, what are the institutions here, like you came here to the House of Civil Society, where the civil society gives opinion on uh, very important uh, political initiatives which will impact uh, 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 our countries and our sectors and economic and social life. So 55% of young people this is the, 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 the figure collected from 27 member states. 55% uh, of young people have no understanding about uh, the European Union. So that might, they might come from rural areas and they might be disadvantaged, but uh, many of them simply live their own life and they're not interested in issues uh, broader than their uh, work they do or their life they live. Uh, they, and that's, that's for sure uh, regrettable because, as I have already mentioned, we have elections in front of us and just uh, less than 100 days uh, the parliament will be re-elected. There will be new members of the parliament and it's very important who are they because they will shape the next five years of, of, of the developments of the European Union. So with this, I uh, just uh, want to thank you and uh, our fantastic panelists. I hope they will be all rewarded. Yes, Sabrina. Yes, please. Now, I, I was not, I was not uh, uh, just saying that. I was uh, promising, and then and the rewards are here. So you, some of you, should be more active. You used the opportunity, missed the opportunity. So, and Ilya, I will bring that for you to, for you to see the FOP, no worry. <laughs> I have one for you, so I will bring, <laughs> I see one for me, one for you. <laughs> and this is, this is, this is, this is power bank. Okay, very, wow. <laughs> now, yeah, yeah, you see. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. And uh, let's, let's take a picture together, yeah? Let's have a nice picture. Thank you.